Good morning, everyone, and welcome to CICC Educational Session 2020. My name is Nimo Magori, and I will be talking about backend improvement in Delta Sigma ADCs. Here is the outline of my talk. It's basically broken down into two sections. Section one is going to be the review on Delta Sigma ADCs. First, I will talk about the need for quantization, and then I will start with the overview, the stability of Delta Sigma modulators, and the excess loop delay. And then I'll talk about CMOS challenges and what they mean in context of Delta Sigma and specifically in terms of quantization. Section two of this talk will focus on the quantization methods in Delta Sigma IDC, which is broken down into two general categories. The first one is the memoryless quantizers, and the second one is the quantizers with memory. And finally, I'll conclude this talk with uh, showing the technology trends in the past decade. So let's first look at the need for quantization in Delta Sigma ADC. If I look at the Delta Sigma ADC, I can break down it to a three main blocks. First is the loop filter which is typically a low-pass filter if we want to have a, a high-pass quantization error. And then the second part is the DAC or DAX in general, which is used to subtract the digital value from the analog uh, value. And the final part, which is a quantizer, which is used to digitize the outputs of the loop filter. Again, the output of the loop filter doesn't necessarily need to be a sing single. Now, in terms of quantizers, the number of bits, delay power, the capability of the summing signals, the loading on the loop filter, noise shaping, and so many other things uh, are the merits of the quantizer. So those are the things that we'll be discussing in, the, in this section. If I look at the past um, around 20 years of research in Delta Sigma ADCs in general, and this has been done by uh, a couple of my students, that they compiled all of the VLSI, ISC, and JSC papers in Delta Sigma, and look at the main innovation. Was it stemmed from the improvement in the loop filter, or was the innovation was basically focused on the quantizer? And you can see early on, most of the research were focused on the loop filter improvement. But as the time progressed, people have started to look more and more into improving the quantizer performance. Now, this can be doesn't necessarily mean uh, the, a, a new quantizer. Some of them can be just looking at the quantizer and way to improve the same old quantizer. And some of them can be uh, a brand new quantizer topology. So you can see certainly that the trend is implying that. In the next uh, uh, couple of slides, I'll describe why the need for improving the quantizer has emerged in the past decade or so. If you look at the quantizer versus the technology scaling, uh, and this plot shows the, on the x-axis the technology node and the y-axis from the top to bottom, we have the bandwidth, Schreier FOM, the log Walden FOM and the ENOP. And the quantizer are broken down to four parts, the flash quantizer, time-based quantizer, all of the time-based quantizer combined, SOR quantizer, and the noise shaping quantizers shown with circle. You can see uh, before the 180 nanometer process node, most of the quantizers employed were flash. But as the technology progressed, you can see more and more of new innovative quantizers such as time-based, noise shape, VCO-based, and SAR ADCs have emerged. And this plot clearly shows the evolution of these in terms of uh, process scaling nodes. Now, what is quantizer? Basically, think of a flash ADC, which is the simplest form of quantizer, is a, if you apply a signal here, then you quantize it with uh, 
set of comparators that are equally spaced apart. And once you quantize it, you get this digital value that is shown in this figure. And the quantization error would be basically the difference between the analog input quality uh, signal and the digital equivalent output. Now, the nature of this quantization error is important in delta sigma. We typically assume the quantization error has uniform PDF, assuming all these three conditions are satisfied. All the levels are excited with the equal probability. The quantization steps are uniform, and the quantization error is not correlated with the input signal. With this assumption, we can assume that the quantization error has a uniform PDF, which is spread between negative positive half LSP, and its RMS value can be calculated at delta, which is the step size, or VLSP, over square root of 12. Now, in general uh, oversampling structure, without noise shaping, what we can do is if I oversample the system, this is the power spectral density and the quantization error power is VLSP square over 12 spread from 0 to FS over 2. If I just oversample the signal, then by a factor of n, then I'm spreading out the quantization error power to n times FS. Therefore, the overall power in the, within the same bandwidth here with the FS over 2 will be reduced. But this technique is not itself as much efficient. To improve it further, we can combine noise shaping and oversampling. And this uh, concept is shown here. Basically, you have the same uh, quantization noise power over your spectral density, and then you'll try to employ a noise shaping, a oversampling, combined with noise shaping. Noise shaping can be viewed as just a uh, high pass transfer function in a, in a simple low pass um, structure. So once you multiply this power spectral density by this high pass transfer function, the noise is going to take the shape of that filter. And therefore, within the bandwidth of interest, we can have a substantially lower amount of quantization noise power. Now, delta sigma modulators are, can be looked at as a Nyquist converter fed into a uh, low-pass transfer function loop. So if you look at this uh, quantizer, this shows a Nyquist converter with this power spectral density. If I include this quantizer in this uh, loop filter, my output is going to have the signal component and the a first order high pass quantization error. So if I look at the response of this uh, filter, you can see that it's a first order high pass filter. It has a zero at DC and a pole at Z equal to zero or infinite frequency. And if I plot the, this filter, you can see again, it follows the same. It has a slope of 20 dB per decade. If I look at the output spectra of this uh, modulator with three level quantizer and out at the over or, or 32 with three levels of quantiz uh, quantization, you can see that it follows the same transfer function. It achieves around 52 dB uh, signal to noise and distortion ratio, and that's only employing three levels of quantization. And at the bottom, I'm showing the time domain uh, output which is the signal, this is the input, and the time domain output, which is the stream of the pulses that you can see here. I also like to uh, pay your attention to these wiggles in the NTF, which ideally we would not have this, but the reason for existence of this is that at this point, our quantization error is not the ideal uniformly distributed quantization error, because you can see there is a strong correlation between the digital output and the input signal, and therefore the quantization error is not as uniform as it should have been ideally. Here I'm showing the quantization error on the top plot, 
of the first order delta modulator, which is similar to the first order delta sigma modulator. And this is the histogram. And you can see clearly that it's not as uniform as we were expected to be. But still, if I compare this with a regular Nyquist, uh, a regular Nyquist quantizer, in the Nyquist quantizer, you can clearly see that it follows the shape of the sine wave, although it's uh, crossed and, uh, on the top and bottom, but it really is very much correlated with that. However, when I do a delta quantizer, uh, sorry, delta modulator, you can clearly see that the quantization error is much more random. And this is because of the fact that we are extract, uh, subtracting the previous sample of the quantization error from the input signal of the quantizer, and therefore we are creating a loop which every time we subtract a more or less random value from the input, creating a more random value at the output. So if I want to build a higher order delta sigma modulator in general term, it's fairly straightforward. If you look at this first order delta sigma modulator, I can lump this as this black box, which is a first order delta sigma modulator uh, quantizer, view this as a single quantizer, and then employ this in another first order delta sigma loop. And this way, we can build the higher order delta sigma modulator loops. Although here, I haven't mentioned that we need to redo the coefficients of these integrators, which is not the main uh, focus of this talk. Now, the, the difference between the first order and the second order is clear from this part. The first order has a 20 dB per decade uh, slope, whereas the second order has 40 dB per decade slope, and we can further increase the quantization uh, noise shaping to third or fourth or fifth order. We get much more improvement in the context of the noise shaping. So here is a uh, output spectra of a second order delta sigma modulator, and here we can see that we have a much cleaner noise shaping and this is because the higher the order of the modulator, the more randomized the quantization error is going to be because it has more terms uh, in the noise transfer function term. So in overall, if I use uh, noise shaping combined with oversampling, in a first order delta sigma, I, I get 9 dB improvement per doubling the oversampling ratio. In the second order, I get 15 dB per doubling, and we can further increase, increase these to higher order. So this trend suggests that the higher the order of noise shaping we get, the more benefit we get to re with respect to oversampling ratio. So ideally, I want to have fifth order, sixth order, seventh order to make my modulator as much um, uh, benefit from modulator as much as possible with respect to the oversampling ratio that I'm employing. If I showed a, a general uh, distributed feed, uh, feedback modulator with input uh, signal feed forward, I can show with an L, this is an elf order modulator. I can uh, find the quantization noise power in the band to be VLSP square over 12 times um, pi to the power of 2L over the loop filter, two times the loop filter times OSR to the power of two times L plus one. And this is actually the term that shows that as you further improve the OSR, or in, uh, you can get substantial improvement, same as if you improve the order of the noise shaping, you get much more so improvement. Basically, the improvement is L plus 0.5 bits per doubling the OSR, or 6L plus 3 dB. Again, L is the order of the loop filter. So all of these suggest that we want as higher as uh, we can get in terms of the loop filter uh, noise shaping. So again, if I if I wrap this up, um, for a given SQNR in bandwidth, we have these uh, basically three terms. It's a VLSP, L, and OSR. 
if I want to increase uh, uh, the efficiency or decrease the quantization noise power, we can increase the number of quantization, quantization bits or increase the OSR or increase the order of the noise shaping. Now, increasing the number of bits in the quantizer, uh, quantizer if I increase by one bit per se, I get 6 dB improvement only. Increasing the OSR is extremely effective, but you have to note that increasing OSR noise shaping it becomes uh, it, we need more active blocks or possibly passive to enhance the noise shaping. However, these are completely intertwined as this talk will progress. I'll show you in much more detail. So the main focus of this talk is it, it turns out to be most efficient if we can actually increase the number of bits in the quantizer, if we can manage that in an efficient way that would be the best way to improve the performance of Delta Sigma EDCs. So in the next uh, set of slides, I'm going to talk about the stability of the Delta Sigma modulators and why that matters in the context of this discussion. So what do we call the stability of Delta Sigma? So if you look at the Delta Sigma loop, there are two important uh, signals. And there are two important aspects that we need to focus. One of them is the stability of the loop with respect to the input signal, which is which defines the dynamic range of the system. And the other one is the stability of the, the loop with respect to quantization error, which is the general stability or inherent stability of the delta sigma. Now we have uh, other definition, and the other one is all the loop filter components are assumed to work in linear region, or they basically they are not saturated. So this brings the question is which one is more critical? Is it the integrator or is it the quantizer? So let's look at the quantizer and the input output characteristic of a general quantizer, an MM level quantizer. In an M level quantizer, your LSB is 2 VREF, assuming you have a bidirectional VREF, over m minus 1, m being the uh, number of level, and this is a mid rise uh, quantizer, mid thread quantizer. So your linear range of the quantizer is defined by m over m minus 1 times 2 times 2v ref. Again, note that the linear range is larger than the full scale of the quantizer. As shown here, we can see the last step of the quantizer is m minus 2 over m minus 1, and the linear range becomes m over m minus 1. So if I generally look at the delta sigma modulator, and this is a general term, if it, the delta sigma loop filter is well designed, and I'm not going to go through like pole zero optimization of that. However, if I look at the quantizer, uh, the delta sigma and its quantizer in general, I can make this statement that I, as long as the output of the loop filter, basically VQ, the input of the quantizer, is within the linear range of the quantizer in every cycle, the loop, the delta sigma modulator is stable. That's assuming that I have taken care of the op-amp saturation and dynamic scaling uh, scaling of the coefficients of the modulator so that the uh, the the op amps and the loop filter is working in a proper order however uh, if the signal becomes too large then the same situation does not hold true so in this slide i'm showing the same concept here more visually. This is the input of the quantizer and this is my quantiz quantization range. If the input of the quantizer is bounded within the, the range of the linear range of the quantizer, the DAC is going to be able to subtract the ex the, all the value that is in the system and subtract it from the input signal. So the negative feedback system is in place. However, if I further increase the input of the quantizer, a portion of this signal is going to exceed the linear range of the quantizer. 
If it exceeds the linear range of the quantizer, then basically it's going to saturate the quantizer. In another word, the quantizer is not going to be able to give a digital representation of that signal, and that signal cannot be fed back to the global DAC of the modulator and subtracted from the input signal. So this is the lost information that we have in the system. And it, that, that part of the uh, uh, signal is not within the feedback of the modulator. Therefore, that can cause insaturation uh, of the modulator. So if I were to show this more mathematically, then I can show a first, for instance, first order delta sigma loop, and I can break the, uh, the signal component into two components. The, the, the large signal component. One part that fits within the linear range of the quantizer, which I call it X linear, and one part which is the part that exceeds the linear range of the quantizer, which I call it X saturation. Now, for the part that is within the linear range, the signal transfer function for that follows the signal transfer function of the feedback loop, which is simply a delay. But for the part that it exceeds the linear range of the quantizer, that part will not see the feedback, therefore the signal transfer function will be just this straight path, which happens to be a first order integration for a first order delta sigma modulator. And you can clearly see if this component becomes too large, it can easily saturate the modulator given it has an integration in it. Now, in to a general rule of stability with respect to the input signal of a, a modulator is as long as VQ is within the linear range of the quantizer, the modulator is stable. This is a sufficient but not necessary condition. I will talk about this sufficient but not necessary um, in much more detail. So if I'm breaking this loop down again, VQ of the modulator is basically the input signal and uh, minus the previous cycle of the quantization error. This is a transfer function for VQ. And the general rule of stability says that VQ should be smaller than linear range of the quantizer, which was M over M minus one times VREF. So if I plug in this to this number, VQ max would be equal to the maximum input signal and the quantization error itself, the maximum of the quantization error is 1 over LSP, defined as shown here, should be smaller than M over M minus 1 times VREF. In a first order modulator, this translates to the maximum input signal should be smaller than VREF itself. That shows the first order delta sigma is inherently stable irregardless of the number of bits employed in the quantizer. Now, if I were to simulate this, I can throw in, you know, a simple and a nine level quantizer at OSR of 16, and I can sweep the input signal magnitude, and you can see it's fairly stable up to almost zero dB full scale here. Um, technically saturates at negative 0.1 dB full scale, but it confirms the theoretical result. But the same does not apply for higher order modulators. So this figure shows a second order modulator. Um, with all the poles placed at infinity. So the NTF is one minus Z minus one square. Now, if I write the transfer function of the VQ in this modulator, the signal will remain just with a unity coefficient or just uh, two delays. And the quantization error at VQ will have two terms, Z minus square and two Z minus one. Each one of these, the maximum of each of the Z minus one or Z minus, uh, Z minus two or Z minus one uh, quantization or each of how will have a maximum of LSV. So if I plug in this uh, to the same numbers that we have, it turns out it shows that X max should be M minus three over M minus one times VREF. M again showing the number of levels in the quantizer. In another, Basically, it says that the maximum input signal that this modulator can process is 1, which is full scale, minus 2 over M minus 1 times VREF. And here you can clearly see we want M to be as large as possible. M, if M is, uh, for instance, 2, 
then you can see the loop, the X can become, becomes negative, which means the loop is, will become unstable. Now, let's put this into a uh, simulation and try to verify if that holds true. So I use the same nine level quantizer and I see that the modulator is stable up to negative one dB full scale, which is basically on a full scale, which is 20 log one minus two, to the power, or two over M minus one. So if I plug in the numbers, it might result in the same thing. So for the stability of the second order, we went through this. And for the general case, we can do the same thing. Again, general things, this is for maximally flat NTFs with all the poles at infinity. If I have, I have not discussed the case where we place the poles of the modulator in the loop, sorry, in the unity, uh, unity, uh, unity circle. So with that in mind, for a general ELF order NTF, the maximum of VQL should be x max plus two to the power of l minus one over m minus one times vref. So if I, for a third order modulator, this is a part that this becomes more interesting. Based on the same analysis, the x max, uh, the maximum vq would be x max plus seven over m minus one times vref. So if I wrap this, it ends up that x max should be m minus seven over m minus times on vref. So given a numerical example, if I use a third order modulator for a nine level quantizer, the maximum input signal should be negative 12 dB full scale or a quarter of VRAF. So again, if I, the same analysis I'm doing for a third order uh, with a nine level quantizer, and I realize that my signal is, the maximum signal that I can tolerate is only quarter of VRAF. And to verify this, I throw it in a simulation. And here I see that there is a discrepancy between what I calculated by hand and what the simulation gives me. And here is the part that the difference discrepancy is. We assumed that the modulator is stable based on analysis it is up to negative 12 dB full scale. But in reality, you can see the modulator is stable up to negative 4 dB full scale. So there is an 8 dB difference between what we calculated and what the, what the real simulation gives us. And this is the term that comes out. We said it's a necessary, uh, but not, uh, it's, it's a sufficient, but not necessary condition. So when I, when this, uh, it, uh, with, with this analysis, we can guarantee neg uh, to, that the modulator is stable up to negative dB, negative 12 dB full scale. But after that, it still might be stable. And I can redo the same analysis with different number of levels. And I can see again, for instance, M equal to seven, the, uh, it should be much less stable uh, compared to that. It becomes ne around negative seven, uh, negative uh, uh, 15 dB, but now I'm stable up to negative five dB full scale. So there is a big discrepancy between uh, the, the analysis and the, basically the hand calculation and the simulation of the system. And the answer to that is actually comes from some other analysis, which I'm going to show you in brief in the next couple of slides. To analyze that uh, this phenomenon in more accurately, we have to look at actually the probability density function of the uh, of the VQ as well. So we for, uh, earlier in this talk we assumed that the quantization noise has a uniform uh, PDF and the signal uh, the samples are uncorrelated in an ideal case. Now. The question that we should be asking is, what is the probability of this VQ to be in vicinity of the maximum that we assumed? So we assume the maximum VQ is, for instance, near VREF, but what is the probability of that ever happening? To look at that in more detail, uh, we look at the VQ for the uh, first order modulator. VQ of the first order modulator has the same, uh, it has just the transfer function of that for the uh, quantization error is just a single delay. So it will have the same PDF as the quantization error. 
Now, I want you to, pay, uh, to note that this VQ is always NTF, the, the transfer function of the VQ is always NTF of Z minus one. So in any, any modulator, that's the transfer function of the uh, noise quantization error. So for a higher order, for a second order modulator per se, this transfer function becomes 2z minus 1 plus z minus 2, and for a third order, it's shown as here, and you can write down the higher order as well. Now, to have a maximum transfer function, each of these coefficients, z minus uh, 1, z minus 2, z minus 3, each of them can take the maximum of plus minus half LSB. But the question is, what is the probability of all this happen? Again, for instance, if this VQ of the third order modulator wants to be maximum, the first order term should be at the negative LSP over 2, the second term should be at positive LSP over 2, and the third term should be at negative LSP over 2. But the probability of this happening is not as high as, as uh, shown in the next couple of slides. So, for a second order modulator, again, given that we, this is a continuous time PDF, uh, we can't just find the probability of this being equal to LSP or equal to any point because that the equal probability because becomes zero. But we can apply, for instance, the probability of this being within the plus the top 90% of its value. So that gives us a very good approximation. Um, so for a, for, a, uh, for, for, the, for a probability of the QE, QE itself to be within the 90% of its value for each sample is 5%. So for probability of, of two consecutive sample being within that range is 5% square, which ends up being 0.025%, which can be, is fairly low. Um, to analyze that, we can easily uh, uh, show the combined uh, PDF function of the two samples. So for a second order modulator, this was our transfer function, 2z minus 1 plus z minus square time quantization error. Basically, the combined PDF is the convolution of the two PDFs. So we have a convolution of 2 QE and a convolution of QE. So this is a this is the QE convolution uh, the the PDF of a QE and this is a, a PDF of two times QE and the convolved output the PDF the new combined PDF it's going to stretch from negative three LSP over two to positive three LSP over two and you can see that this does not have the flat form that we were expecting it shows that it has lower probability to having a larger valued as opposed to the nominal values in the center. So this is, was the only the probability of the quantization error. Now assuming that I apply my input signal is a ramp signal or a random signal with the equal probability between negative A and positive A with the uniform PDF, then combining these three it gives me, again, this is not exactly the form, but it gives me a, a general PDF which has, again, more uh, uh, more probability in the center. And as we go through the tail, which is going to be A plus minus uh, 3 LSP over 2, it has less and less chance of occurring. So all this is saying is that although we calculate that the maximum of VQ should be within the linear range of the quantizer, and we calculate a certain value for that maximum of VQ, that maximum can never happen, or it might happen one in every million cycles. And if that's the case, that still the modulator can be stable. So the further we go down to higher the order of the loop filter, for instance, in a third order, now we need three consecutive samples of the loop filter to, to be within their, for instance, the 90% of their value. So the probability of that becomes smaller and smaller. And this uh, shows actually a histogram of a third order modulator that we simulated earlier. So you can see the quantization error. Most of the samples are actually within the linear range of the quantizer. Um, that's why the module, this was at, at negative 8 dB full scale, which based on HAL calculation, it should have been unstable. But you can see uh, most of the, actually more than 99.5% of the samples or 
the VQ range falls within the linear range. And a very few samples will exceed the linear range, but just a very few samples are not going to make the modulator unstable. So in conclusion, We, if, if all the poles are placed at infinity for, simply, for uh, simplicity of the calculation, we find that the sufficient uh, but not necessary condition is that to have the maximum of the signal plus the maximum of the quantization noise power to be uh, within the linear range of the quantizer. But we further realize that we don't as this, although this is sufficient but not necessary. Oh, sorry, this is necessary but not so, uh, so. Yes, this is sufficient but not necessary because we can exceed that range. And uh, given that if only a few samples occur with outside that range, the modulator is still stable. Now, there are other ways to improve the stability by using different pole placement in the, in the system to reduce the out-of-band gain of the modulator, which is, out, uh, uh, which is out of the uh, focus of this talk. Now, what I do want to emphasize is by, by looking at the stability, we can say for a given order of the loop filter, there is only one way to improve the stability, and that is improve increasing the number of bits in the quantizer. And you can see the number of bits in the quantizer, basically M in this case, or the number of levels, not only can reduce the overall VREF, but can also increase the overall the X maximum or the maximum signal input signal that we can apply. So it will improve the performance twofold. It will reduce the number the quantization error power therefore allowing larger input signal to be processed by the loop so that's one of the reasons again that there has been a large focus on improving employing large number of bits a quantizer in the delta sigma uh, in an efficient manner so this is again the uh, recap of what we discussed earlier. By increasing, by reducing either the out of band gain or reducing the LSP step size, the quantization noise will decrease and the maximum tolerable signal will increase and it's proportional because the X max is proportional to one LSP. So the higher the order of the modulator, the less number of samples we require for the out of range uh, stability. This has been done by empirical study. Um, there hasn't been any mathematical framework to prove that. By increasing the maximum signal, you get a significant power performance advantage in the, in the general loop because you, you not only you've improved your dynamic range, you, you can reduce your thermal noise specification as well. Now, in general, if you use the poles inside the loop band to improve your, to reduce your out of band gain, you can provide a better anti-aliasing or signal transfer function as well, but that's again outside the focus of this talk. So, in the next set of slides, I'm going to talk about the excess loop delay, and this may seem a, a, a little bit irrelevant to the quantizer, but I'll show you as uh, as progress through this set of slides why the excess loop delay also matters in the context of improving the quantizer. Sure, for most of our analysis, we assume that the loop filter is a discrete time loop filter, but this is, a, uh, in, gen in general case, the loop filter can be either a, a switch capacitor discrete time or a continuous time uh, loop filter. So, for instance, a loop filter in discrete time uh, with all the poles at infinity uh, are, is shown here, whereas in continuous time, you can build the same loop filter with active RC integrator and following the fo this transfer function. In a continuous time uh, loop, uh, the sampling occurs at the front of the quantizer. How do we build continuous time transfer function? Is basically instead of discrete integrators, we use uh, uh, typically used active RC integrators where the transfer function is shown with K over S. 
is an ideal case. Um, we don't have any sampling switch typically, again, in active RC integrators. Um, there is no direct input sampling cap, so there is uh, some benefit there. Uh, the DAC can be continuous time or discrete time either case. Uh, the loop transfer function still remains uh, continuous time in nature. How do we go from the uh, this, uh, uh, how do we go to design a continuous time? Is basically we typically start with the discrete time and then we transfer the continuous time coefficient. And for for to do that, there are a couple of uh, approaches. We can do the space uh, state space transformation or the modified Z transformation, or the most common way which encompasses the pulse, uh, the DAC pulse delay is impulse invariant transformation, which looks at the uh, loop filter fr from the way that you apply the, uh, the step, uh, the delta function to the DAC, all the way to the in uh, front of the quantizer, and for it will put uh, if you put these two equivalent to each other, then we can find the co proper coefficients for the uh, continuous time loop filter. Now, the impulse entire invariant transformation here is shown. Uh, is shown here the inverse uh, uh, Z transform of the loop filter in Z domain should be equal to the inverse uh, Laplace transform of the DAC pulse and the loop filter pulse at t equal to n times ts. Now, why the DAC pulse matters is because in continuous, in discrete time, we look at the uh, timing in terms of clock, it's each sampling case of the clock. So if this quantizer works within one clock cycle, we can assume that the quantizer has no delay. But this is not true in the case of continuous time delta sigma modulator. In continuous time delta sigma modulator, the, uh, the, the timing is basically continuous. So if the clock is sampled here and the quantization error is, uh, the, sorry, the quantization output is available just a short delay after that shown by tau d here, this tiny delay can significantly uh, deteriorate the performance of the loop filter. This slide shows a simulation of a second order modulator with respect to the loop, uh, with respect to the quantizer delay. And you can see as I sweep down the tau d from zero to one clock cycle, the achievable, the SNDR drops significantly and it becomes almost unstable as we go down around 0.7, uh, uh, 0.7 uh, clock cycle or 70% of the duty cycle of the clock. Um, so you can see that it falls down the, and the maximum input falls down significantly. So at some point the loop becomes even unstable. So at first, if you have a small amount of loop delay or quantization delay, you, you'll, the loop is stable, but your input signals start to drop, but at some point the SNDR becomes completely uh, and approaches zero. So how do we fix this. The, because of this excess loop delay, we created an extra pole in the system and will affect the second term of the impulse response, which will require a compensation, but neither none of these coefficients in the loop can actually stabilize that because we do not have that coefficient properly. This coefficient, the, the coefficient that is unknown to us, it's defined by this tau d, which is the loop delay. Again, I'm showing here in discrete time, but the same concept can be applied in continuous time as well. So to fix this, we actually need to add another coefficient to the loop. And here, I've done this, which is the most common practice to, uh, to do so, is to have another DAC at the input of the quantizer with another coefficient, and we call this excess loop delay compensation DAC, or ELD DAC for short. So with this, we can easily address the excess loop delay, which is in discrete time is very uh, discrete, is either 0 0.5, which is half a clock cycle or one clock cycle in continuous time, Typically, it's the same, but it can vary in a continuous fashion, depending on how much time we want to allocate for the quantizer to operate. 
So this slide shows the same in the context of continuous time delta sigma. We need an additional feedback. This additional feedback typically is formed around the quantizer. Now, this also imposes a new challenge in context of designing a quantizer. I can use an op amp here to add these, the DAC signal and the loop filter signal together, or I can have a quantizer that has the capability of adding multiple signals together. So that's one of the things that it also matters when you're designing a quantizer. I will call this through this lecture, through the rest of the lecture, as a summing node of the quantizer. If the signal has the inherent capability to, up, uh, to provide us with a summing node, or does it require possibly an active block or some sort of passive summation of the signals to, uh, to operate properly? Now, in the next set of slides, I'm going to talk about the perspective of the advances in the CMOS and what does that imply in terms of the quantizer needs for delta sigma loop. I can break down the delta sigma modulators into two uh, separate categories, single loop and multi-loop or mash. Single loop modulators um, are very relaxed in terms of op amp gain and coefficients, but they suffer from stability in general as you increase the order of the modulator. On the other hand, mash structures can be fully stable because they employ a cascade of lower order loop, but they typically suffer from requiring a large op amp gain and very strict coefficients. Now, if you look at the modern CMOS scaling, um, as uh, modern CMOS scaling provides us with lower intrinsic gain and lower supply voltages. Lower intrinsic gains push the, pushes us to use single loop modulators, and we want to have a higher order modulator to become uh, to have more efficiency in respect to the oversampling ratio, and that pro uh, provides us with some stability criteria. On the lower power supply voltages, because the dynamic range is reduced, we want a larger dynamic range, therefore mash structures are more suitable because they are stable, but they require high gain op amps. So you can clearly see that these are in, contra uh, in contradiction with each other. High gain op amp is not achievable in, with uh, modern CMOS. And at the same time, lower power supply voltage creates a large stability problem in terms of dynamic, achievable dynamic range of the modulators. So we are in the, in the dilemma on which, which direct to go. So if I go briefly over the multi-stage noise shaping structure, uh, basically I take the quantization error of the first loop, I feed it to the second loop, and I subtract the digital outputs from each other via some digital transfer function. This, uh, in, in a case of a uh, one plus uh, or a two loop mesh, the digital transfer function are, are, are a place that the output of the first loop filter should be basically the signal transfer function of the second loop filter. But the digital transfer function placed at the output of the second loop filter should be equal to the noise transfer function of the first loop. Now, if I can manage this, I can have a basically a, a higher order overall noise shaping without actually employing each uh, individual high order loop. So I can have, for instance, for an nth order modulator, I can cascade n first order modulator to get guaranteed that the system is fully stable. However, the problem is the digital transfer function that I place at the output of the second or the higher order loop filter is in terms of it is placed it is implemented with digital uh, functions, whereas the analog transfer function that it needs to match is based on with analog uh, uh, components, and these two will not match and will cause some uh, quantization error to leak at the output actually unshaped. This situation is far worse, actually, if we use a continuous time system, because in continuous time system, not only the op amp gain is the one part that uh, will change the coefficient, but at the same time, the RC variation will also significantly impact the coefficients. So this becomes a much more uh, dif difficult challenge to address if you're looking at continuous time systems. So 
With that being said, continuous time delta sigma modulators are generally limited to single loop implementation. There has been a couple of works in terms of using, you know, a bank of coefficients to address those uh, RC variation, but still they are largely dominated by a single loop. And to help the stability of, of a single loop, people have typically moved to using larger number of quantization levels, which if you do not use it efficiently, if you do not implement an efficient quantizer, it becomes a major power consumption factor in the overall loop. Not only that, there is another part that it's missing from basically the literature, and it's basically very, very hard to um, quantify it accurately, and the added complexity of the quantizer, it's not only, only on the quantizer itself, it's also what it imposes on the loop filter. So for instance, if I have a flash quantizer here, and suppose I have a 4-bit flash, I have 16 comparators uh, placed here, there is obviously the inherent power consumption of the flash itself, but there's also another part that we should note, and that is how much added power consumption it will add to the loop filter because it's imposing a significant loading either on the active block that is active adding block that is adding all the signals to the flash, or if there's no active block, and if these integrators are directly feeding the signal to the flash, how much extra parasitic capacitance is putting loading on the integrators of the loop filter, which is fairly difficult to, to measure in any sense, um, especially in a, in a silicon, because you cannot disconnect the loop and try to measure the power with and without the quantizer. But it's something that you can clearly see in based on the, uh, the body of work that has been presented, and you can see that the quantizers that produces um, less input parasitic capacitance ends up having the over better overall power efficiency, as I will show at the end of this talk with the in the in the detailed study. So, in conclusion of everything that in this section that I discussed, when you look at the stability and dynamic range of the modulator, we require a larger number of this in the quantizer. If I'm looking at the high speed operation of the modulator, because of the uh, uh, excess loop delay complexity, uh, I'd, I'd rather have a quantizer that has a summing node, that that's a big advantage for us. If I'm looking at the continuous time operation, um, I'm limited to a single loop, still I need a large number of quantization uh, bits. Um, to improve my dynam dynamic range. And I'd rather have minimum loading on the loop filter in an ideal case. And then again, I want lower power, higher speed, lower noise, and lower kickback along many other merits in my quantizer. So that's this whole section that I discussed so far is the whole reason why the quantizer are gaining more and more attention as opposed to loop filter. Again, I don't want to downplay the importance of the loop filter, but the innovations of the loop filter is becoming less and less uh, challenging uh, because the, in many cases, for instance, if you have an active RC integrator, um, you're restricted by the design and op -amp, of the op amp that has been studied well for the past 50 years. But the quantizer in Delta Sigma, it's a, it's a different phenomenon, and it's, it's, it's a more recent movement to improve the performance of, of those. In the second section of this talk, I'll talk more about um, the quantizers. Now, the second section, as I uh, showed in the outline of this talk, is broken down into two general type of quantizers. One, or the first type, are the memoryless quantizers. The memory class quantizers are basically the quantizers that do not store any memory of the previous cycles. And they are basically typically are uh, quantizing and reset basically in one phase. The most common type and the most used uh, quantizer in Delta Sigma ADCs is actually uh, the flash quantizer. They are the fastest of any types of ADC in any case, either in Delta Sigma or outside as a standalone quantizer or in pipeline ADC. 
the resolutions in Delta Sigma is typically limited to 4-bit and lower. Again, there are some works over that, but it's, it introduces a significant amount of drawback if you increase uh, the resolution further. There is the, the, the challenge remains in the comparator offset, especially in Delta Sigma, that you have to guarantee that the comparator offset is smaller than LSB over 2, because if, you, if that criteria is not guaranteed, then you cannot guarantee the monotonicity of the quantizer. Therefore, it can possibly make your uh, Delta Sigma loop unstable by creating a, a positive feedback. Now, the, the downside of the flash quantizer is the large kickback on the input signal and large capacitive loading that is imposed, will impose on the loop filter. So again, I had this drawing earlier. Flash ADCs are typically large in physical dimensions. Therefore, they add, add too much routing the burden would be on loop filter to drive all of this routing. And at the, at the same time, because they have so many dynamic or clocked blocks, they, they can apply a significant kickback on the signal that is driving it. On the bright side, it, they are actually one of the simplest ADCs or quantizers to design. So the complexity is fairly low. Even the calibration techniques, there are so many calibrations uh, developed for flash ADCs that can be easily applied. So the, from the design perspective, is 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 fairly straightforward design. Um, here I'm showing one of actually the uh, chips that we worked on. Uh, is uh, here it shows a uh, four for the delta sigma, and this is the uh, flash quantizer. Now, I want to, uh, the reason I'm showing this is just to give you a perspective of what I say, the, uh, the, capa the loading on the loop filter. So this is my loop filter, and this is my 4-bit flash. And the routing, I mean, even if you put the flash directly in front of the loop filter, which we couldn't for several reasons, um, you have to, each of these white lines here shows the input of one comparator. So this is the flash itself, and you can see you have to drive at the minimum amount, if you put the loop filter directly here, you have to drive all of these comparators, and you can see just the metal routing of those will add significant loading to the loop filter by itself. So that's the power, that's the un, unwritten power consumption that we, you can't basically it is very hard to easily it's very hard to simulate and almost impossible to measure directly now flash can be improved in one sense or another and one of the most interesting ways to do so is to use a tracking quantizer the tracking quantizer is basically, you can think of this flash ADC. If I'm employing a flash in ADC, in delta sigma, if I look at the output of the delta sigma, and this shows, for instance, a simulated output of the delta sigma, what, I can, what we can notice is that the cycle to cycle change because of the oversampling employed can be only one or two uh, uh, bits uh, or levels. So, if, if, for instance, this is the output sequence of a couple of samples that I'm looking at, and you can see the first code, this is a thermometer output of the flash, and the signal here goes up by one level, comes down by one level, goes up by one level, up by one level, again, comes down. So from one cycle to another cycle, it is not like, for instance, a MDAC in pipeline that the flash can go from zero all the way to full scale. In Delta Sigma, because we have oversampling uh, 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 because of the overall sampling nature of this, the input signal has much lower, lower frequency compared to the clock. Therefore, the variation is of the signal from one cycle to another is, is much less significant. Now, the concept of the tracking ADC is instead of using a flash and clock, for instance, all of the comparators in every cycle, I can clock only the comparators near the last uh, the point of the input signal. For instance, here, I, for the next cycle, I only clock this code, the neck, the top code, and the bottom code. So the three or basically the five comparators near the last, the largest comparator that was triggered in the last signal. 
So this failure can significantly reduce the power consumption of the uh, quantizer by focusing only that the comparators that are needed to be clocked. The rest of them, for instance, I can guarantee that if my signal, for instance, in this cycle is here, in the next cycle is not going to be all the way up there. So I can focus only on this range of this input signal. This is the main concept behind the tracking quantizer. Now, the implementation is much more elegant than I discussed. It uses an integrator uh, to, to uh, uh, not even use the whole 16 comparators. Um, it just uses three comparators to begin with. But overall, it's a it's a very impro uh, important improvement over the just using the bare flash ADC. But at the same time, it comes with the risk. And if the the variation on in the input signal uh, exceeds the tracking range that we can track with this quantizer, the modulator may become unstable. So, for instance, you assume that the signal uh, cycle to cycle, you do not have more than five bits, uh, five levels of change. But if for any reason that becomes seven level, your quantizer cannot capture that, and therefore fails to provide uh, uh, pro, uh, pro, uh, it acts like the quantizer have been saturated, therefore the loop becomes uh, unstable. So that's one of the challenges uh, to, to note when designing a tracking quantizer. The next quantizer is SOAR quantizer. Again, I'm not going to discuss the SOAR operation. That uh, is, is well studied in many extra other papers. They are very, very efficient in terms of power consumption. They are very scaling friendly. Um, however, they are slow. They require multiple cycles to resolve the bits. The, the advantage in context of Delta Sigma is that the ELD can be compensated using additional capacitors. Uh, here, uh, there are a couple of works uh, using ELD in that fashion. And the added loading to the loop filter is not as significant because uh, these capacitors can be fair, fair, fairly small. At the same time, we do not go more than four or five bits here. So the total capacitive load is not as significant as, for instance, flash ADC. Now, there are a couple of interesting advantage of the SAR that you can, you can leverage in, con in the context of Delta Sigma or just a standalone SAR. Um, one of them, for instance, uh, is that uh, people have used uh, uh, this, this interesting word has used LSP truncation to reduce the global die complexity. In another sense, you use a 6-bit SAR here, but you do not want a 6-bit global feedback, so you use your LSP locally to truncate that, and you use only the 4-bit global DAC here. So that's one, one interesting way to leverage SAR. In another uh, work, you can, for instance, uh, use uh, SAR uh, to improve the uh, noise shaping, given that at the end of the SAR conversion, this, uh, the value stored on the capacitor array is the quantization error. So you can take that quantization error and feed it back to the loop filter or other and provide some type of a transfer function or a, a low pass transfer function for it to provide a higher order noise shaping for your loop filter. You can do the same actually in digital to get that quantization error and feed it to another ABC and pass it through a digital filter and subtract it from the, uh, from the uh, next cycle to provide a, not a higher order noise shaping. So all of these makes SOAR very attractive. However, they cannot be used in very high speed delta sigma because they require multiple cycles to operate um, and provide the output bits. The other approach uh, to quantization or memory quantization is actually time-based quantization. Um, the concept here is to convert the loop filter or the signal to a time output or a PWM output. And then once you do that, then you can quantize uh, the, 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 uh, the signal, which is in PWM now, with a stream of uh, inverter delays or gate delays. So for instance, the PWM conversion can be done traditionally using two comparators, or it can just be done with a current star delay cell. So you just connect the input, the output of the loop filter to this, and with, uh, you, you apply the clock, and basically this becomes the control voltage of your current star of delay, 
Therefore, you can create a delayed uh, PWM signal, a very coarse PWM signal, but it might be sufficient for two, three bits of resolution um, anyways. So these are very scaling friendly because you're doing the quantization uh, in actually with gate delays, which scale very well in processes. Um, they still suffer uh, from the speed limitation, given that the speed of these quantizers for for multi, multiple uh, bits, for instance, for four bits, you need 16 clock edges to count, and that takes a significant amount of time. However, in terms of power consumption, they are very efficient, and they also provide a very nice summing node at the front end here. Another way of the time conversion is to use a traditional do slope ADC. Um, the, the operation is that in one phase you integrate the input signal and the other phase you discharge. Um, basically, the discharging is the equivalent of having a uh, PWM conversion. They are highly linear, they are very, very linear. They are, very, they, they are relatively scaling friendly in terms of the clocking counting, but they are slow. But the active element that we here use is either can be re uh, re uh, reused for the loop filter or it can be used for the summing and the ELD compensation. So again, other advantage of time base, again, as I'm showing here, you can easily apply the summing, build, build the summing block here without adding anything, uh, any significant loading to the loop, loop filter. For instance, if you have a current store delay uh, chain here, and if you need to add multiple signals, you can add, just basically add one single transistor for each of the signals that comes uh, from the loop or from the input signal and sum them all uh, in this fashion. They are very compact in layout in terms of physical size. Therefore, they have minimum added parasitic and loading. For instance, um, in, in many cases, when pe what people do in these designs, if they want to sum it in this fashion, you can even put this transistor local to each of these outputs and take the drain out. So there would be no added routing in for the op amps uh, to to uh, to add, you know, to pass the capacitance or loading or coupling in that sense. So it makes them very efficient if your sampling speed is not very high. Again, here shows that all of this summing can be fairly uh, simply combined in this type of quantizers. So in conclusion, the memoryless quantizers, I can break it into three general types of categories or one shot type of an ADCs, which is typically flash. Um, they are fast. Uh, they are the, by, by far the fastest ADCs that are out there, but they introduce a very large loading on the loop filter they do not provide a good summing node. Um, you can increase the number of inputs for the comparators to add the summing, but that adds a significant overhead. And they typically have the large power, largest power consumption in, type, in quantizers. The binary search type quantizers such as SAR are relatively slow. They have a moderate loading but they have systematic ways to improve the overall performance of the modulator. And they have one of the lowest power consumption that's out there. The time phase frequency or PWM or time-based type of a quantizer are slowest. They have the, the best type of a signal combination, the least amount of loading of the, on the loop. They have the smallest typically the layout and, the, and moderate power consumption depending on the way that you do the PWM conversion. Now, but I do want to emphasize that the multi-step quantizer is also very popular using one or a couple of these approaches. For instance, using a binary uh, uh, SAR in the first phase and the time phase frequency in the second step. So uh, there are a significant amount of works using a combination of these to build a multi-step or two-step quantizer in Delta Sigma as well. In the next section um, of this talk, I'm going to talk about the quantizers with memory. This is actually the part that most research in the past decade has been dedicated to. So 
So what do we mean by uh, quantizers with memory is the quantizer that inherently store portion of the quantization error internally. Now, it can be either in time, frequency, phase, or voltage domain. This is different from, for instance, taking the quantization error of a SAR and feeding back from it because it's not inherently there, but we are adding another component to take that quantization error. These quantizers provide extra orders of noise shaping, typically just the first order noise shaping. Then they are often implemented in time, phase, frequency domains because they are very uh, uh, flexible in those terms. So the, the most common type of uh, the noise shaping quantizer is actually VCO-based quantizer. Now, to, uh, to, to explain this, let's think of a regular ring oscillator, and you have a counter here. Within a, if you apply an input signal, or as VTune shown here, to the, this oscillator, and count the number of the oscillation within one clock cycle, you have a quantizer. So, for instance, within the first clock cycle, I see that each phase is varying like this many times. I call this code like 18. It varies 18 times. I call this 18. If the input signal is larger, it oscillates at a higher frequency. So within this time, if I count the number of oscillations, I see there is, for instance, 36 in the example. I, start, I, I put the equivalent digital code of 36 to this. And if it's a lower input signal, I can see my uh, oscillation is less, and I count 30. So basically, a ring oscillator, each output of the oscillator is tapped, and it's counted, is combined. And, in, and it's saved in the register. Now, this is not actually the uh, impl uh, common implementation of it. This is just this figure is just how to explain how it works. The, the common way of implementing it is using a multiphase array. But before going to that, let's look at the how the, the in the well, VCO based quantizer we have memory, and that is actually due to the phase integration. In this example, I assume that I have a fixed DC value for the input signal or V tune here. And look at the oscillator output frequency is uh, fixed as shown here. What you can notice is that if you start to count every, uh, every crossing here, you see that the, at the end, the phase carries over to the next cycle. So for instance, in this code, I count four rising edge. So my digital output is 4, but VCO is not reset to start from the same point or from 0 again. The, the, the peak of this signal is carried to the next one. So in the next one, I have less amount of toggling because I started at a high peak. So then my code becomes 3. And for the fourth one, because I started you know, relatively on a lower input again, I count larger value, which is four. And this basically over time averages the input signal, which basically implies a first order noise shaping. And again, this is due to the phase carryover. This is the amount of phase that is to be carried from the first clock cycle to the next clock cycle. Now, the way that People typically do a VCO-based quantizer is using a multi-phase VCO. In a multi-phase VCO, for instance, if I want a 4-bit quantizer, I put the equivalent amount of the inverters in my ring oscillator, and I look at I don't look at the number of oscillations of the oscillator as opposed to the couple of slides ago that I was showing. I look at the phase change between two cycles of the operation of the VCO. This is shown here in this uh, particular example. In the first phase, for instance, this is the state after the t equal to n of the inverters in the, in, the os uh, in the oscillator. And at t n plus 1, this is the state of the inverters of the oscillator. So some of them have changed their phases. So I take the XOR of the, these two cycles and this will give me the code that I need uh, that uh, is shown here. So I'm looking at the, how many of my inverters or how many of the phases will change within uh, a clock period. And I will call that uh, the, the, the digital output of my quantizer. So what I do is I need uh, two registers. 
one register sample the current uh, cycle of the uh, current uh, current state of the uh, phases of the oscillator and the other register counts holds the previous value of this and then i you know, xor each each bit separately and each of that will provide the output of that quantization step now the interesting property of this type of quantizer it also is provide an int intrinsic data weight averaging um, again, I'm not going to de explain what data weighted averaging e exactly is. Um, there, that's a dynamic element matching for the DAC. But if you look at this and if you compare this with a flash quantizer, a flash quantizer, if the code, for instance, is five, it starts from here and it takes five. And the next code is seven, it starts from again the first code and it takes seven. But here you can see the codes rotate around and rotate around. For instance, you can see that this code is seven starts from here and ends from here. The next code is five, starts from the first, goes to the five. The next code is two and starts from here and goes to uh, here. Which basically means that the DAC element selection is going to rotate over and over. And that means the, all of the DAC elements are selected with equal probability and they are shifted because it's been rotated, and therefore it provides the first order noise shaping for the DAC element mismatch. Now this is a significant advantage because this is inherently there, uh, inherently there, as opposed to, for instance, a flash ADC where you have to manually do that, and that takes added time and uh, digital power consumption. The VCO-based quantizers are very efficient in, uh, in terms of uh, power uh, performance trade-off. They provide, again, DWA. They provide first-order noise shaping. And, and you can easily get three to five bits of uh, quantization with, uh, with VCO-based quantizers. Now, if I want to model this in, uh, in terms of how in, in mathematical form, uh, I can look at it as first we have the VCO and then I have technically the quantizer in phase and then I, I take the first order difference. In another, uh, if I map this to the mathematical block, first I convert my input voltage to phase. VCOs basically integrate the phase. This is the VCO noise. It's typically within the band of interest. It shows as a low pass filter. That's a no low pass uh, noise. And then, because it's integrated, and then I have my sampler, which is the digital sampling and the output. And then here is a, a wide band quantization noise being injected and the first order difference. When you take the first order difference, the VCO uh, 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 noise becomes, a, again, a, a simple wide band noise, like a, a, a white noise and the quantization noise becomes a high pass filter noise. Now, one thing that is interesting about the VCO pace, they have almost an ideal integration because they do the integration in phase and people typically say they have infinite gain of conversion from the uh, voltage to phase and they also typically have a large bandwidth in the sense that they react almost instantaneously to input signal change. So they have a very large bandwidth. However, one of the challenges in VCO-based quantizer is the nonlinearity. Within the same plot, what we did not show is the nonlinearity of the input to phase conversion, or in other terms, we can call this as a tuning gain, and this will cause this significant distortion in the in the input signal. So, if the input signal is this fundamental tone that I have here, after this conversion, it will it will have so many harmonic replicas. Now. People do argue that, <coughs> excuse me, given that this is placed at the back end of the loop filter as shown here, the distortion is less critical, which is true. But at the same time, you can see still, if the distortion is significant, you still add so much uh, distortion or harmonics within your band of interest. So there is a trade-off. VCO quantizer are very efficient, but at the same time, typically in a VCO, the conversion gain is nonlinear. Now, in general, 
VCO-based quantizers are very scaling friendly because they are inherently operating based on gate delays. They are also a gate-driven type of architectures. The, the input to these architecture is typically just a uh, gate of a transistor, PMOS or NMOS. So they are perfect uh, summing. They, they create a perfect summing node similar to one that I showed you is in a time-based conversion. And they are actually fairly low in complexity design. You know, of, uh, design. They provide an inherent anti-aliasing filtering given that we look at the window of a signal change. So that provides a first order anti-aliasing filtering. They often require calibration for the running oscillator, uh, running oscillation, as well as the, the nominal uh, free running oscillation speed of the oscillator. Now, in the past decade, extensive research, or I can say the most amount of research has been done in the improving the merit of VCO-based quantizer um, in delta segments. The other type of uh, quantizer which is similar to the uh, VCO-based quantizer is the gated ring oscillator. Unlike the VCO where you get, uh, you have a uh, continue, uh, a analog voltage driving an oscillator, here we will have a gated ring oscillator, which basically means we have an oscillator which is driven by an on and off signal. To do that, we need to first convert our V in voltage to a T in, or basically make a conversion from voltage to PWM, and then use that PWM to run, to operate an oscillator. This oscillator is running at a fixed frequency, but is basically gated and operates within a certain duty cycle. The operation principle is very simple, similar to the regular VCO except again the operation is done with a fixed uh, input in an on-off uh, 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 fashion. So within the same, uh, within a clock period, we look at how long the, the T-in is on and that causes the, uh, uh, the gated ring oscillator to oscillate, or oscillate at when the uh, input ends. It keeps its state, basically it, it will keep the phase and when the next input comes in, it will continue, resume from the previous state and continue its oscillation. And we look at the number of phase changes, uh, exactly similar to the VCO-based quantizer, and we extract our digital output. It has ex almost identical properties to VCO-based quantizer. Again, the biggest difference is here is that we have a T in rather than V in. Now, the, the one challenge in uh, gated ring oscillators is that in ideal case, we assume when we turn off the uh, GRO or where T in is zero, the GRO is going to maintain the state without any change, maintain the inherent state of the inverters or to maintain the phase without any problem. However, in reality, what will happen is that when you turn off an oscillator, uh, the, oscillate, the GRO, you'll still have some leakage current. And that leakage current, which is through the drain source of the inverters, will start to discharge the inherent states of the uh, oscillator, therefore causing the loss of the phase of the information. And not only that, that time off is inherent to the difference of the input of this current signal to the next signal. So the amount of loss is signal dependent, which makes it uh, more or less nonlinear. To address this, there are some techniques. One of them, for instance, is called switch string oscillator. And in this case, instead of turning off the GRO, as shown here, we turn it from uh, full operation, which in a regular when the input signal comes, and when the input signal is zero, instead of turning off the oscillator, we switch it to a specific lower frequency oscillation. Now, in this case, we set this frequency so we know, for instance, within a, uh, uh, within a clock cycle, how many oscillations this is going to take. For instance, say it oscillates three times within a given cycle. Therefore, we know that every cycle we have to subtract a, th a digital value of three from our final digital output. And this will completely eliminate the need for uh, the, the, the leakage problem 
But at the same time, as a complexity of how we should set the V low voltage or the off frequency oscillation, so it doesn't add too much complexity to the counting and subtraction. Now, the other uh, or one of the last works in types of noise shape integrating quantizer is based on the dual slope ADCs. In these quantizers, um, the, the traditional dual slope is we integrate the input signal and uh, in one phase and we, dis, uh, we discharge with a fixed slope in the next phase and we count in the next phase the number of clock cycles that we can fit through this. There's a continuous time comparator placed at the output that detects a zero crossing, and at this point we reset. So this is the traditional dual slope. In the modified dual slope, rather than uh, stopping the discharge exactly at the zero crossing, continue the zero crossing till the next edge of the counter clock, we keep the residue here, and we add the next signal on top of this. So in this fashion, what worked here is basically the quantization error because uh, this is my time full scale and this would be my quantization error in time. Therefore, this would be my quantization error, uh, negative quantization error. And when we apply the input signal on this one, basically the input signal will be the current input signal minus the previous sample of the quantization error. Therefore, this acts as a first order delta sigma modulator by its own. So the advantage and disadvantage of this one is the, the benefit is this first order, it provides acts like a first order delta sigma, it can be highly linear, it requires a single continuous time comparator. And the biggest advantage is the quantization error is also available in both analog and time domain. It provides a window sampling, but at the same time, the biggest drawback is it's very slow similar to every other time conversion um, type of a coin. Now, there are, there are ways to improve the uh, speed of this uh, architecture. One is to look at the polarity of this, uh, of the, the, the uh, output of the integrator first and discharge based on the polarity. So you take the MSP out. Therefore, for a three-bit implementation, for instance, you only need five delayed clock edges for your counting clock. The comparator can be also replaced with a clocked comparator to reduce the power. And you put basically um, five uh, flip-flops. And at the end of this, uh, at each delay, you clock this flip-flop or the clock the comparator and read the output of the comparator. If the zero crossing has occurred, you stop the discharge. If the zero crossing has not occurred, you continue the discharge to the next edge. One thing also worth mentioning that is, although earlier in the last slide I showed that you'd, we use an op amp for the integration, that op amp can be actually one of the integrators of the loop filter, so it doesn't necessarily require a dedicated op amp. Now, one important aspect, one uh, interesting benefit of this architecture is that it also not only provides the quantization error in time domain, as I mentioned earlier, it also provides the quantization error, sorry, not only provides the quantization error in voltage domain, it also provides the quantization error in time domain, which is basically the time from the zero crossing till the next edge of the counting clock. So the PWM of the quantization error is available for free. So it can be easily, for instance, to drive a gated ring oscillator. Um, so, for instance, if you have the, uh, the noise shape integrating quantizer here and you get a first order noise shaping and uh, you take the quantization error in time, which is f available inherently in this architecture, and you feed it to GRO, which also requires a PWM input, and then you combine the digital outputs and you can get a second order noise shaping. And this was uh, published by our group a couple of years ago in ISC, and we call this double noise shaping quantizer and they work on the fly. So it doesn't require another cycle because the quantization error of this one is available during the conversion of this uh, uh, of the first quantizer. So in conclusion, um, integrating quantizer or memory quantizer are, are very popular in the context of technology and scaling. Um, they typically have a combination of analog and digital such as VCO based 
They have been the main topic of the research in the past decade. There have been so many works in this context that most of the work are actually focused on the quantizer rather than loop filter. And they are, they are extremely efficient in terms of power, speed, resolution, trade-off. They also provide a good summing node typically because they are driven by a gate or an active block that makes it easier to add the nodes at the ELD. So it makes a per, uh, simpler in uh, makes the backend of the loop filter simpler in terms of design of and complexity and the power consumption. So in the next set of uh, slides, I'm going to show the technology trends and how you know in terms of technology how the uh, quantizers have evolved. So first. Here I'm looking at the process scaling with respect to uh, the ENOP of the Delta Sigma ADCs. So this is the process on the x-axis, I'm showing the process nodes. And on the y-axis, I'm showing the ENOP. As you can see, the, the ENOP on the trend line showed here with the dash line shows that the Delta Sigma has grown less in resolution and that's actually more application driven because earlier Delta Sigma were looking at very high number of bits for audio application and, me, and at the midpoint it becomes sensor applications and now they are into the wireless applications. So the demand has moved from higher resolution to more bandwidth. But you can see earlier on they were almost exclusively the quantizers were used as flash. But as the time has scaled or the process has scaled as time has moved forward, we can see more and more different types of quantizer and a lot of them are noise shaping quantizer, including SAR and some time based approaches here. But as you can see, again, at the lower end of the technology nodes, we do not have sufficient data to, to plot the uh, complete trend. But up to 28 nanometer, you can see it's becoming more and more dominated. And interestingly, these very well start at 180 nanometer node. And you can see from then onward, we see more uh, type of a noise shaping quantizers. In terms of uh, process, uh, the figure of merit and in the Walden figure of merit specifically, you can see that a lot of content here again is a uh, log Walden, the reverse of the log Walden FOM. So the larger is better. You can certainly see the much more improvement in terms of FOM. And a lot of those are actually the most efficient one are the ones that use SAR. And then after that, you can see all the other type of noise shaping quantizer. Again, flash also comes in the same line because, but they are typically used in a higher speed type of a quantizer or very advanced technology nodes as well. So this, the next one is the Schreier figure of it, uh, which follows ex the same exact trend. Um, you can see a, a combination of these, but one thing I also want to point out across the past uh, a couple of last figures that we saw is that um, you can see the uh, in the the use of the novel type of quantizer is as popular as using the traditional flash quantizer. So what I do want to emphasize is that the flash quantizer is not obsolete by any means. The, all of the other quantizer are different types of approach. You can see still very decent, uh, you know, figure of merits reported with flash quantizers uh, that are better than the possibly the counter noise shaping quantizer. Uh, but all of the, the, depending on the application or the speed or the bandwidth that you're looking at, um, you can pick your optimal quantizer for that application. The last one is on the, in the context of speed, and here you can see, clearly see the line, the difference between the those on the using the flash quantizer and those that use other type of quantizer. Especially in the modern node, you can see the flash are much on the higher speed, and most of the other quantizer fall below. Um, in these ranges, you can see they are spread equally, but almost exclusively flash is the fastest curve on, on the top side here. So by this, I conclude the talk and thank you for your attention. Great.
Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Neil Magari, for a nice uh, uh, talk. So I think now we're in the uh, Q&A session. Uh, so I'm going to open uh, the Q&A uh, 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 platform on the, the bulletin board. So I think there is one question already posted. By the way, uh, uh, for the audience, uh, please, uh, if you have any questions, please post your question uh, on uh, the uh, Q&A uh, part that is really important, and then we can see your question, and then I'll ask the question, and then Professor Magari will be able to answer it. So I'll start with the first question. I think this is uh, asked by uh, by Tim uh, from IBM uh, Research. Uh, so the, re the question is, you mentioned the concept of a tracking quantizer with a flash, uh, so that you can actually disable certain comparators uh, uh, if they're away uh, from the previous decision. But then the, the question is how do bubble errors in the flash ADC impact this approach? Um, uh, thanks, uh, Nan, for uh, the introduction, as well as uh, pointing out the question. Um, I just wanted to first make sure, uh, can you guys hear me? I can hear you very well. Uh, I think okay, the audience, all the feedback, uh, I don't think they can, uh, the audience cannot speak. So it's hard to, uh, yeah. but I think I, I hear very well. Uh, yeah. Okay, excellent. So uh, regarding the, uh, the uh, tracking quantizer, um, I would I would want to point out that the, what I showed was actually the concept of the, the or, or what I would say the principle of operation. Um, we technically don't use a full flash AVC and we select the comparators, although we can do that. Um, but rather than trying to select the, the flash AVC on the, uh, based on the previous references, what the, uh, we typically do is we put a um, quantizer uh, uh, sorry, the, the digital integrator. Uh, I'm trying to share my screen here to see if I, uh, uh, if, if my screen here shows. It, it says that the, the screen is shared. Uh, can you see my screen, or is it uh, popped up to the? Your screen. I think it's uh, you're you're showing the screen. Okay. So this uh, basically this is uh, the uh, on the top. You can see. Let me select the laser pointer. Um, yeah. Um, so, anyways, it doesn't select the laser pointer. So, on the top, you can see that that's how actually we built it. We try to put an integrator after the quantizer. So, once we put an integrator after the quantizer, what it will really happen is that given that this is an oversample system, it will automatically push the input of the quantizer to have less signal component by pushing, by providing a, a very strong low pass filter. And then we obviously need to adjust the loop filter coefficient. So we still use a, a simple flash ADC, maybe a four level or three level flash ADC, um, but the references of that flash is fixed. We do not select different comparators. Uh, this way we can still use bubble correction scheme without any penalty. At the same point, I want to note that, that when you're using a technique such as this, unless you have a uh, thermometer to binary converter, typically the bubble uh, correction in, in this context or in context of delta sigma in general, it's not a, a killing factor. So you can get away without using any bubble correction scheme as well. I hope that answered the question. Great, uh, great, sounds great to me. Uh, I, uh, I think for now there hasn't been uh, new questions posted by the audience, so I guess I will uh, ask one question. Uh, so one question I Absolutely. think uh, you have covered many of these uh, very interesting new noise shaping quantizers, uh, basically quantizers with memory, right? It's a very nice uh, uh, summary and it's a, a very clear that a lot of research on that over the years, especially the recent several years, so I guess my question to you would be, uh, let's say that uh, for different applications, for different, let's say, speed or, or, or like resolution requirements, what would be your recommendation? Let's say maybe putting in some numbers, uh, let's say for certain uh, resolution, beyond certain bit, below certain bit, or a certain frequency, beyond certain frequency, below certain frequency, that uh, your, your view would be the best, most suitable uh, quantizer solution for that. Okay, that's a great question. Uh, so uh, let me uh, clarify one thing that I think I possibly missed uh, to, uh, in, the, in the presentation. 
now that I hear back my own voice, and is that um, what you see on those plots, there's also that they don't complete the whole the whole picture, and that is why uh, the the reason for that is uh, a lot of works. For instance, if they have a new idea in the integrator. Um, so, for instance, they, they built a new type of a DAC or new point of integrator. They, trend, they tend to just build, put a flash quantizer to de-risk their design for publication. It doesn't mean that that idea necessarily would have worked best with flash, but just to simplify their design, that, that, that's my own PhD, uh, my, my own uh, research group does. If I, if I have an innovation on somewhere else, I don't want to taint it with adding some type of VCO quantizer or some kind of SAR quantizer. So, these uh, that also sometimes sway the plot towards you know flash, but if you look at the more recent, I would say unless you're going in in anything below, I mean I'm talking about the process, not anything below 65 nanometer. Unless you're going anywhere above a gigahertz sampling speed, um, typically noise shaping quantizers tend to be better, uh, especially something like VCO based quantizer. And uh, one of the main reasons I can say is, especially as the the, the move towards the having a, a continuous time double sigma fil uh, loop filter, having that extra anti-aliasing on top of the extra noise shaping is significantly beneficial, as well as they provide a very good range of calibration that. If you look at, for for instance, for uh, wireless uh, uh, modems, they do want a significant amount of calibration, and these type of quantizers are very flexible to that, as opposed to flash, where it's it's very I mean, it can be extremely fast, but they are not as flexible. So if I if I'm going for for instance a 5G that I need to probably clock my delta signal at 8 gigahertz, um, it would be. Re, like exclusively flashed, uh, it is very, very difficult to do anything else. But anything be, um, yeah, below some gigahertz range, I still think there is room to even either use the current uh, developed technique, and your group has done a phenomenal job in that well as well, uh, or you know innovate on some other aspects by time interleaving a couple of these quantizers to increase the bandwidth of those. So they're still at their infancy. I think there is another decade of research is going to happen on these to make it still push the boundaries of speed resolution. Sounds great. Uh, and then I think there's one more uh, question uh, posed by uh, Fabio uh, Sebastiano from uh, Delft University of Technology. Uh, so the question is, you comment on the limitation of GRO. Uh, is the nonlinearity a showstopper? Yes. Um, uh, let me again go back. To my screen, I don't know if it's still shared or, or the sharing has stopped. It's still, it's still shared. Okay, great. Um, so yes, if I go to GRO, yes, that's it, right. Um, so the the, the, the nonlinearity obviously of the GRO really depends on the design of the GRO. Per se, if you use uh, look, like if you have access to thick oxide transistors with extremely low leakage. Um, then the nonlinearity is not as significant, except obviously you have to think about that you also have the nonlinearity of the voltage to time conversion. So that that is still there, similar to VCO. So that that's going to be there. This is something that is added on top of it. And as I mentioned in the talk, the distance between the you know the T in of the current pulse and the next pulse is also dependent of the, on the input signal. So that that leakage, if it's there. It's directly proportional to the input signal, and therefore make it actually makes very strong harmonics. Um, so I would um, again, but this is at the back end of the loop filter, so you're getting three-bit quantization out. So if you look at the published work, uh, the nonlinearity at the back end of the loop filter, if you have a third-order or fourth-order loop filter, that really is not a, a a killer. But at the same time, it's something to at least I would say it's something to pay attention to while you're doing the design, either on the circuit level or at the system level. Great, thanks much. I think due to the time, li uh, time limitation, we'll uh, stop here and then let's thank uh, the speaker once again. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nima Magar. for a nice talk. Yep. Um, thank, thank you, you. Uh, for presenting. Yeah, so thank you.